optimistisch sein, aber... I don't want to be a pessimist. But these aren't the conditions you want to climb the big wall in. When you need more than 20 hours in good weather, how long does one need in bad conditions? The question is, what to do in this situation? We can't take any risks here. Das erhabenste Schauspiel Feuerlands, 1000 Meter höher. 1000 Meters higher than everything around it. Charles Darwin called this mountain the most sublime spectacle in Tierra del Fuego. And when you love mountains, you can easily become enthusiastic about this mountain. Its isolation, its beauty, and perhaps even its diva-like qualities. The mountain shows itself so rarely, yet when it does, it's unbelievably beautiful. Like something from another world. A trip to Sarmiento is basically a logistical nightmare, because the mountain is in the middle of the ocean, and you can only get there by boat. Fritz Miller is a mountain guide and one of the strongest mountaineers I know. Axel Voss, I know from several climbing trips, and we get along really well. We both have the same enthusiasm for the mountains. It's essential that everyone stays in a good frame of mind. Sometimes you have conditions that are so tough, you can't even imagine. But you still have to stay calm and make the best of the situation. I think this is important when you're trying to get here by boat. You're sharing 10 square meters with four others. You can't let your emotions get the better of you. Otherwise, it could turn into a nightmare. Our point of departure is Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world. Ushuaia is in Argentina, and the mountain is in Chile. So you have to travel from Ushuaia to Port Williams to take care of the formalities. From Port Williams, you travel west through the Beagle Channel, then into its northeast arm. From there, you continue in the Bajanero Channel, and then through the Cockburn Channel directly to Monte Sarmiento, which basically borders the Cockburn Channel. We arrived at Port Williams and were already at the harbor's office by evening. It looked as if we'd get the licenses and would be able to leave the next day. This turned out to be wishful thinking. We were missing a permit from Punta Arenas and had to wait another two days. When mountaineering in Patagonia, some stoicism and fatalism is needed without a doubt. Otherwise, you start to despair here. You want to take off. Conditions are excellent, but you're not allowed to, because all that's missing is a piece of paper. It's annoying and frustrating, but it's the way it is, and you have to make the best of it. Departing from Port Williams means things are finally getting started and we're finally off to Tierra del Fuego. You leave civilization behind you, and you're on the sailboat. The slapping of the waves, the wind whistling in the shrouds. For me, that's when the trip really starts. This is my seventh trip to Monte Sarmiento. The mountains and the ocean are what do it for me. I'm basically a sea dog, a beachcomber. I learned to sail as a kid. And the combination of sailing and mountain climbing is what makes this so fantastic for me. 
But one also has to say that Tierra del Fuego is in itself amazing. With green rainforests and glaciers that run directly into the ocean. And giant mountains over 2,000 meters high. For me, this has to be the most amazing place in the world. Here, when you reach any summit, it's always something special. You really move through the mountains here with another level of consciousness. The Pia Fjord must be one of the most beautiful fjords in Tierra del Fuego. You sail into the mountains and at the end of the fjord, three glaciers flow directly into the ocean. And above, you have mountains over 2,500 meters high. One of the most spectacular fjords on the planet. The mountains here are the highest in the whole Cordillera Darwin. The weather did us a favor to clear up completely. We had half a day of sunshine, turquoise green water, blue skies and the summits were completely free. That was one of those moments, a gift from the gods. It's an absolute gift to be here. I think you only realize afterwards when you feel something like this, which sounds so corny. Right now, I think this is really great, but when I'm home after about a month, it'll be like, wow. I think you only realize afterwards what you were actually experiencing. Right now, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It really is incredibly amazing here. This is really This is the only thing I want now, is that this thing... Uh, must to be fast because the wind is blowing from everywhere. Twenty, fast, fast. Rápido, rápido, rápido. Más o menos, Carlos. A la piedra, grande que hay allá, más o menos. Carlos, hey. Wait. Anda. Okay, we got a base camp here. <laughs> No one has ever really lived in the west of Tierra del Fuego. The only people you find here are the fishermen. It's difficult to imagine under what conditions they live out here. They come from Punta Arenas to fish between two to even four weeks under the most miserable conditions. And during that time, they collect between 60 and 70,000 sea urchins. There's a rumor that licenses have already been sold for salmon breeding here. In other words, everything that is prohibited in Europe is still happening here. Meaning the usage of antibiotics and overfeeding the fish. The salmon breeding companies are moving from the north to the inhospitable south. In that way, one fjord after another is being used. And when it's no longer possible, and the fjord is basically biologically dead, they move on to the next fjord, which basically means the destruction of nature around here. At the moment, 
Man seems to think that he controls the world. I think this is only a short-term and idiotic way of looking at things. We humans are so caught up in technological and communication madness. So much so that the real beauty and peace that you find here get completely lost in the normal stress of everyday life. Here you can get back to your roots. I think time spent here would be good for anyone. Today we have uh, well, uh, full weather conditions and we have this sailing on this area that is quite complicated. If you have 5 or 6 degrees of water temperature, it's supposed that you will last on the water before get to into hypothermia 6 minutes. The life jackets are only to take a dead person, you know, from the water. That's the, that's the truth. I don't want you or any of you on the water. Paul Thoreau, a writer who wrote about his travels, once said that in Patagonia, you had to decide for either the gigantic or for the tiny. On the one hand, you had this rough climate, this terrible cold, these terrible storms. And then when you go on land, you're surrounded by vegetation that's so magical in every detail that you think you're in a Japanese garden. These tiny plants, with leaves no bigger than half a centimeter, and these tiny moss plants, for example, are unbelievably intricate. For me, there's no landscape on the planet that is more beautiful than this one down here on the southern tip of the Americas. It's freezing cold. It's super windy. Welcome back to Escandayo. I think I've spent about five months in total here. Doesn't really feel good at the moment. Somehow I must have repressed something. But whatever it was, it's coming back with a vengeance. The strategy was to get up to the advanced base camp, even in bad weather, to leave the necessary equipment for a summit climb, and then return to our base camp on the boat. After that, we would wait for good weather to get up the mountain and back down again. The first obstacle you have to overcome to be able to approach the mountain is the forest. As beautiful as it is, when you're moving through it with a lot of equipment, it becomes torture. It's already a difficult undertaking, and not to lose orientation is also a problem. As the saying goes, when you're in the forest, you only see the trees, and you lose your sense of direction. So you really need to prepare well in order to find a fast, effective way through the forest. We 
We can only rely on the weather forecast and not on ourselves. We need a forecast for one or a few good days, although we'd be happy with one good day. When you go to Tierra del Fuego, you always have to count on the possibility that you won't even be able to see the summit, and therefore won't be able to attempt a climb. We can't blame ourselves if we fail due to the weather. At this point, I don't regret being here. Regarding everything else, we'll have to see. First, we continue up the small trench, and then we continue up along the ledge. After the forest, you have the so-called moss ledge. One wrong move and even a broken ankle or a strain would mean the end of our mountain climbing dreams. This can happen really quickly on this mossy ledge, in the blink of an eye. It was good that we were able to approach the mountain and get out of the forest. Into the high mountains, into the snow, and onto the glacier. I felt that we were getting closer to our goal. We were all thrilled. We found our energy again. It helped us to push on when we realized we had made it to the glacier and we were on course again. Da können wir die Sachen lagern. Da. Alles ist fertig. Alles ist angerichtet fürs Dinner. Everything is finished and we're ready for dinner. Now we only need good weather for about 20 to 24 hours. This mountain doesn't have more than 10, maximum 14 days of good weather per year. And the tendency over the past years has always been that at the beginning of April, there's a few days, maybe two or three, of good weather. In the end, it's just like playing lottery with the weather. Oh, shit. Oh. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so I had to take six, 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 six Mike. Cuatro. <laughs> Back in the boat, we waited for a good weather forecast. We received daily updates, but it never looked as if it was going to get good enough. So it basically meant waiting and hoping that sooner or later, good weather would finally arrive. After waiting for 10 days, we got a weather forecast that promised a rise in air pressure, which got our hopes up again. It was clear this was going to be our last chance, since we only had two days left before heading back. And I still hope that for these two days, we'd be seeing good weather. We not only had the problem of new fallen snow, but we're also fighting against wind speeds of up to 100 kilometers an hour. It was a battle against nature's forces.
it would probably be best to build a snow cave here, but there's not enough snow. So we have no other choice but to pitch our tents. But it isn't all that bad either. The spot here is amazing. And the tents will hold, I'm sure. We're starting from a really bad position now. We probably have to break trail forever tomorrow morning. I don't want to be a pessimist, but these aren't the best conditions to climb any big wall. Hope is usually the last to go, so we still had a little hope left. But after we heard the new forecast, it was clear. We only had one day left with more or less good conditions. Basically, I knew then that this was it. Again. My seventh trip to Sarmiento. The seventh failure. What a letdown. The mountain is a diva. A beauty to look at, but dangerous as hell. This morning she was once again playing with her admirers, bathed in a pink light, enveloped in clouds, not allowing us to see the main summit. Then, for a few minutes, you could actually see it, before it was covered again and you thought that was the end of the spectacle, only to later once again see it in its entire beauty for about an hour. From our advanced base camp, we could see the entire mountain, which is shaped like a pyramid, a 1,500 meter high, perfectly shaped triangle. If a kid were to draw a mountain, he would draw Monte Sarmiento. We decided to make the most of the remaining half day of good weather and took on a smaller summit that was rising right above our advanced base camp. And eventually we were maybe even the first people to climb Cuerno Negro. Obviously it was a smaller summit compared to Monte Sarmiento, which is a thousand meters higher. But it was still an extremely impressive summit anyway. The unique thing about Tierra del Fuego is that everything is so wild, so isolated, so deserted, and at the same time so demanding, so impressive and in a way so serious. One goes through the mountains here with a different level of consciousness. What none of us expected was the view from the summit, looking towards the bay where our boat was, down the steep glacier, the view was sensational. Of course, it was standing there and knowing it hadn't worked out. At the same time, it's a pretty common situation in mountaineering, and I've learned to deal with this. When something challenges me, then I'm willing to keep coming back for it. But only time will tell. 
to experience nature's beauty up close and so powerfully, it would do us good in our lives and help us to become more humble. A lot gets lost in the fast pace of our lives. I'm more in harmony with myself here. Whether I've made it to the summit or not, it really isn't.